I should warn you, throughout this series of videos, I am going to be asking you to directly perceive the essential meaning of the symbols I'm going to show you. Now, if that's gibberish to you, um, I am putting a link down below in the description of this video for another video that I have made that gives you instructions in the direct perception of essential meaning. It gives you examples. It's a very good video. Um, a good entry into the perception of essential meaning. But it's a very simple thing, so don't be afraid, you know. Um, this is no big commitment. It's actually very simple and very easy. It's something we do automatically, but we don't recognize that that's what we're doing. So this makes that process um, more conscious. That's all we're doing. Um, but essential meaning, it's fundamental to understanding any symbol. Because that is the language of symbols, essential meaning. A visually received essential meaning in you know, these kind of uh, two-dimensional uh, symbols, <clears throat> diagrams, if you will. They don't work, you know, they don't communicate on purely rational levels. Where they communicate is at the level of essential meaning. And the same is true for the tree of life. Uh, it's all about the essential meaning. That's the way in the essential meaning. Then there's the rational overlays of what each part of the symbol uh, stands for, what planet, what zodiacal sign, etc. Okay. So, throughout, I will be saying, you know, perceive the essential meaning of this symbol um, and the different parts of the symbol that we'll talk about. Okay. <clears throat> The tree of life, uh, the earliest known writing um, that we have to that establishes the Kabbalistic tree of life is a book called the Sefer Yetzirah. This is a modern edition in English. I'm sure it's in a few other languages as well by Rabbi Arya Kaplan on the Sefer Yetzirah. It's the best book on the Sefer Yetzirah, modern book on the Sefer Yetzirah in English, in my opinion. Um, it was written somewhere, well, the only copy that we have was written somewhere around 100 BC. Okay, So that's the first copy that we have. You know, uh, it had obviously been something, it wasn't developed the day before this was written down. You know, it's a fully evolved cosmology that is spoken of in this book. And it's a Kabbalistic uh, meaning really um, a cult in that sense. Uh, something that is is kept secret and conveyed only in small circles. Um, yeah, something that everybody doesn't read about and know about. Um, so, <clears throat> the uh, tree, the Sefer Yetzirah describes the tree of life. And it's really, it's really an instruction manual on uh, a magical, of a magical operation, put it that way. But it exposes the full cosmology of the Tree of Life diagram. Now what the diagram that it 
describes is what I call the Gras tree, which is what I will pre be presenting you here. There's all kinds of subtle little clues in the wording of the Sefriyat that make it plain that this is the only one of the various, you know, versions of the Tree of Life that truly fits the uh, Sefriyat There are certain statements that describing things that only occur in this version of the Tree of Life. The other things you see in the Golden Dawn version, the Western Hermetic version, uh, the, the Hebrew version, the Ari uh, tree, etc., uh, etc. Et the that is not what is being described in the Sefer Yetzira. It's the Gra tree, okay, and it's um, <clears throat> an archetypal tree. All the other trees are based on the archetype of the Gra tree. They distort the shape of it. They, you know, reassign letters to paths, um, make the uh, letters, make different connections than the Gra tree, okay? But this is the archetypal statement of the Sefer Yetzirah, which is what I am working with here. That's the, the basis. But for me, <clears throat> again, I've, I've said this before, it's not about uh, Judaism for me at all. Um, there is no religion uh, to the Gra tree. Uh, from my perspective, it's purely cosmology. It's purely about the structure of everything. <laughs> from the macrocosm, you know, from the whole to the microscopic. So every single thing is structured like the Gra tree. It is a description of consciousness, the structure of consciousness in all of its phases. <clears throat> now, the tree of life is an arbitrary human construct because of the way our brains work, the way we perceive, the way we think, etc., we need to <clears throat> break everything down into small bits that we can comprehend small bits at a time and we sort of add all those bits together and come up with a, a more comprehensive picture. That is basically how our consciousness works, our brain-bound uh, awareness. Um, so, in order to understand something as big as the cosmos, we've got to break it down into parts. We've got to understand it bit by bit and slowly grow our understanding. That's the way we do it, at any rate. Um, whether or not that's the only way we can do it, but it is the way we do it using our brain-bound awareness, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, we make these arbitrary uh, distinctions between parts, like astral, uh, physical, astral, and mental. These are arbitrary. These are just uh, ways that we have of describing certain aspects of the universe of existence in... Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, there are not, in reality, these divisions. It's all one thing. And that's really, for me, the beauty of the Gras tree, because it's clearly one thing. It's one thing. Outside of it is who knows what. 
it's the white on the page. You know, it's one thing. <clears throat> it's self-contained. It's perfectly balanced. This is the cosmology of uh, the Sefer Yetzirah, of the Kabbalistic tree of life, okay? <clears throat> so, this is an arbitrary human construct. You know, it, it's an accurate, to my mind, an accurate, objective, an objectively accurate description of the structure of the cosmos. It gives us a way to understand it to such an extent that we can then participate. That's the whole point of the symbol, to give us a doorway into participation, not just a, um, an intellectual understanding. Okay, that's why in this work we're going to rely upon the direct perception of essential meaning. Because that results not in an intellectual understanding, but in experiential understanding. Because perceiving essential meaning is to experience the essential meaning. Okay? So we want to look at this symbol and experience the symbol and learn about the symbol. Okay. Now the most standard uh, idea of the structure of the universe, of cosmology, um, <clears throat> is this, basically. It, uh, it's based on the idea of everything is spherical. The outermost sphere of the cosmos is God, the prime mover, the prima mobile, okay? The next in is the fixed stars, okay? Because, hey, we're looking up out at the cosmos and this is what we see out there. It's all the fixed stars but then there are the movable stars. There is the, uh, the sphere of Saturn, because it moves the slowest. You know, later we figured out that that meant that it is the farthest away. But for us at first, our only cognizance of Saturn, because we could see it with the naked eye, we noticed that it was moving through the sky, and it moves the slowest of everything that moved through the sky. And then there was the realm, the sphere of Jupiter, which moved a little bit faster. Then Mars, which moved a little bit faster than that. Then the Sun, which moved, you know, once around every year, was sort of ruling our lives. Then there's Venus, was much closer and much faster. And then Mercury was so fast. And then the moon. The moon, our moving light in the sky. So close that it moved around the whole zodiac once a month. It gave us the rhythm, okay? So this, you know, an Earth at the center because it was always geocentric, you know, everything revolved around the Earth. That's the first impression from merely looking at the sky. You know, the development of mathematics, etc., you know, enabled us to figure out, you know, the actual movement of the planets. But at first, where this symbolism comes from we weren't thinking of them as these objects of the actual physical, you know, uh, uh, planets around, you know, the sun, you know, to begin with, but around 
the earth. We didn't first think of it that way. They were gods. They were spirits. These magical beings, you know, that were influencing our lives in this way. And this is the essence of astrology. It's not about, you know, uh, the planet. It's not a astronomy. It's about gods and forces and spirits. Okay? That's the root of this sort of cosmological conception. So what this nets us, this onion version, is that everything is contained within the prima mobile, within God. Then everything inside that is contained within the fixed stars. And then everything inside that is contained within Saturn's sphere, okay? So the outer contains the inner. And it defines ten levels. The seven planets, the Earth at the center, the uh, zodiac, and the prime mover, okay? Those are ten levels um, defined by this cosmology. And it's just observation. You know, looking out from where we're standing into the universe. And these are the things we first noticed, and they were powerful. They had so much power over our lives. And in different ways, like the sun had a different power than the moon has. You know, Mars had a different power than Venus has, you know, etc. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, the tree of life image is essentially a version of the same thing. It's much more complex. It's much more, uh, to my mind, much more evolved as a, a philosophy and cosmology. Um, and it's much more integrated. It has the same uh, layering in it, like everything is within Kether, the topmost Sephiroth, you know, is contained in Kether. Uh, Malkuth, Hod, Netzach, Yesod, Gedbura and Gedjula are all contained within Tiferet. And each contains what is below it. So in a sense there is that onion layering effect. Um, it's just not presented visually in that same way. Here there is a, what's called the lightning flash. There is a progression, a downward progression. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> these ten stations, these ten sephirot, um, <sighs> are different in meaning than the, s the uh, seven planets of the other cosmology, you know, the other diagram. These seven sephirot, these middle sephirot, do not relate to the planets. We divorce the planets from the stages of the, the cosmos, from the, the construction, the, the basis of the cosmos. The planets are assigned to has a connection between the Sephirot. So these Sephirot mean far more than the planets do. Even the planets of astrology, they mean more than these planets do. Okay. Kether means very much the same thing as the prime mover and Hulkma means very much the same <clears throat> as uh, uh, the zodiac. 
but they're more than either of those. Bina carries much the same meaning as the, the zone, the sphere of Saturn. Parts of Bina do, but Bina is much more than Saturn, especially the modern understanding of the planets, which is far different than the understanding of the planets at the time the symbol was constructed, okay? We have to remember that. We always have to remember that the, the designers of this symbol <clears throat> had something else in mind than our modern conception of the planets. They had no conception of the planets such as that. The planets were spirits. The planets were gods. You know, the planets were forces that impacted us in these particular ways. Okay? We knew the planets because we recognized their impact on our lives, which is very different than our modern conception. Our modern conception doesn't take into account the effect that, that Mars has on our lives as it circulates around the zodiac, around the sky. You know, it, that is not part of our modern conception of the planets. So we can't think of the modern, we can't think of the planets in this context in the way that we do in just normal thinking. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is an arbitrary human construct. Never forget that. It is, however, an accurate, to my mind, like I said, it's an objectively accurate uh, cosmology. Uh, a cosmology without any real philosophical bias. Okay? So, the symbol itself, here is the symbol at its most complex. And here is a symbol at its simplest. The difference between these two is that one contains the hidden paths and one does not. In the Sefer Yetzirah, all that is spoken of is this simple graw tree uh, and without any mention of hidden paths. The hidden, these are all the lettered paths. The 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet connect the, seven, the 10 Sephirot in these ways, okay? These are the connections represented by the letters. That is the meaning of the letters, the Hebrew letters, which is, in this context, a magical alphabet. All of the letters mean something. And, you know, they, they are packed symbols, very intensely packed symbols full of meaning each one different than the next, each of the 22 representing something else. Um, so that's the symbol set we're using. We start out with these 10 sephirot. That's the foundation of the tree. That's what powers the tree. The connections are just that. They're connecting the sephirot. They have no more power than that the connection they make between the sephirot, okay? So the, the driving force here are the sephirot. The paths, the connections, just are channels of that force. That's what it is. So what holds these 10 sephirot together is the structure of the, the passage of forces between, within itself. It is a singular whole that has all these parts that interact in these ways. And again, that defining of parts, this definition into all these parts, 
is the human construct. That's just a human way of coming to understand how all these parts that are we've defined for ourselves, they don't exist in objective reality except in the human mind. And we can make use of them as things that exist within the human mind. At any rate, so. <clears throat> now this symbol is a symbol of the structure of the cosmos. From the most supernal sublime to the most dense uh, physicality. Everything exists. I mean, every, this is the template for everything that exists. The part and the whole. Okay. So when I'm talking about this symbol, I'm going to be probably switching back and forth throughout with statements about the cosmological implications of the various parts of this symbol and the personal application <clears throat> of the parts of this symbol. It's all of these things. You know. At the same time, it's just a single thing. As is the cosmos. That's one of the main lessons of the Tree of Life. That we are participants in this one thing. Everything is participating in the one thing. We're enacting the one thing. We are this one thing. Okay. <clears throat> so, the symbol is composed basically of five different factors. The first factor is the driver of the whole thing, the ten sephirot. <clears throat> that roughly, you know, uh, carry forward uh, philosophically those, you know, ten uh, spheres that compose the old cosmology, or the previous cosmology. <clears throat> so, this the ten sephirot are what we have defined as the ten levels or phases of the I, the one self, as it manifests its wholeness. Okay? The ten sephirot are the I. We connect with the I in Kether, the first one, okay? But the whole is there within the eye. This is the body of that awareness. And this is how the, the unity, the awareness of the one self moves throughout its being. And these are what we have defined as the ten levels of that awareness, of that one thing. <clears throat> Next <clears throat> are what are called the mother letters. The first at the top is for is the shin for the fire. The middle one is aleph for the air, and the bottom one is mem for the water. Now these are the elements in Kabbalah. Um, the mother letters, but they are more than just the elements that we deal with in initiation and hermetics. The elements that we uh, inhale and exhale and project and manipulate, they are not just that. In Bardonian terms, 
they are more akin to the philosophical elements that he's always referring to, which are more, encompass more, speak more about aspects of the cosmos that we have defined as fiery, as airy, as earthy or watery. Okay? So in the, in the Hebrew Kabbalah, there is no element earth per se. Okay, now one thing I should say, Hebrew is always read from right to left, unlike English, which is always read from left to right. So when we move down the tree in the diagram, we're going first to the right and then to the left, and back down again to the right, and then to the left. So we read it as in Hebrew, not as in English. For example, when Hebrew is written in a circle, we're reading it counterclockwise instead of like we would in English, reading it clockwise. Okay, so <clears throat> there are first the three mother letters, which are the archetypal philosophical element, the essence of the elements, fire, air, and water. And they're always presented <clears throat> as the poles, shin, and Mem with Aleph mediating, air mediates between. Okay, so pointing out that Aleph is here in the center of the structure. And it, so it gives us these first impression of three realms, at least, to the tree. Second uh, of the five, are the planetary paths. These are the vertical paths. There are seven vertical paths in this tree. And they start at the beginning, at the top, with Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and Moon. Okay? These are the standard seven planets of occultism in the standard order. There's nothing changes in the order. The numbering of them is the same as in that ancient cosmology with Saturn being given the number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there, there need be no confusion about the numbering of the planets. The numbers that we've all learned for the planets still abide. You know, they still apply here in the Graw Tree. But they don't apply to the numbering of the Sephiroth. Okay? Of which there are ten. <clears throat> the next symbols, the next components here, the fourth of the five, are the zodiacal signs. And this is all the diagonal paths. This completes the structure and stabilizes the structure of the tree of life. Okay? These are the 12 signs of the zodiac. Okay. <clears throat> the fifth, I always add, because they really complete the tree, are not mentioned in the Sefer Yetzira. They're not really mentioned in any of the Kabbalistic lore but they're unavoidable when 
working with the tree, and those are what are called the hidden paths. These are the paths that have no letter corresponding to them, that have no fixed symbolism. That means that they are different for everything. They express themselves differently in everything that exists. The lettered paths express themselves in predictable, known, identifiable ways in everything that exists. Each of us expresses these paths in the nature of our being, okay? Everything does. But the hidden paths, these hidden, so-called hidden connections, these unnamed connections, um, <clears throat> well, they're just that. They're unnamed. They have to be experienced to truly <clears throat> understand. I can describe to you my understanding of what happens in that connection, but your experience will be ever so slightly different. You know, I can describe universally what the, the lettered paths mean, what that connection means, because it's all been mapped out and, you know, labeled. But the hidden paths I cannot, and they add a sense of mystery to the whole thing that make it even more unique, make everything even more unique than just a simple tree of life does. <clears throat> so that final layer makes it a much more complex symbol, and I will save that, therefore, till the end. Um, <clears throat> what we will do, what I will do is discuss each of these components in order. One uh, week will be a discussion of the Sephiroth, at least one week. But it's going to be, you know, a, a pretty much a summary of the Ten Sephiroth. And we will look at the essential meaning of that aspect of the symbol over and over as it evolves, okay? Then we will talk about, I will talk about the, uh, um, the addition of the mother, mother letters to the symbol, those three horizontal connections. And we'll start making connections between the Sephiroth. And then we'll move on to the planetary connections, the seven vertical connections, and what they mean. Again, it'll be an overview. I won't go into the detail of one by one at this point. And then we'll do the uh, zodiacal, the 12 zodiacal plan uh, uh, connections, and then we'll move on to the hidden path again in overview. So we'll flesh out this symbol for you. And then after that, I plan to go, plan at this point, to go into detail in each specific one of those components. Each Sephiroth, excuse me. Each Sephiroth, each mother letter, etc through the whole tree and by that point <laughs> hopefully you know I will have conveyed what I need to convey about the Kabbalistic tree of life and its cosmology so uh, uh, one thing I want to say is the word that I'm using over and over again is Sephiroth now, what does that word mean? 
to the English speaker, we always immediately think that it means sphere, right? Because it's so similar um, to the word sphere. But it has absolutely nothing to do with a sphere. It sort of, uh, sort of relates to sphere in the sense of realm, you know, the, the sphere of, of, of the sun, which means sort of the realm of the sun, uh, or in that old cosmology, the sphere, okay? Um, but it n does not refer to the shape of sphere. So these circles on the tree of life are not actually spheres. You know, we can certainly imagine them as spheres, and it, it works. It's a, a good allegory, but it does nowhere is it described as a sphere, a circular object. This is just symbols that we've been used, uh, have used. But what the word sephirot means is basically it means several things. It can mean several things depending on the context and the vowels that are used in the construction of the word. Uh, it can be book or number or uh, even diagram. So it's something that contains a lot of information. It symbolizes so much. And here in our use of it, each of the Sephiroth has a number, one through ten. Okay? And the Sefer Yetzirah is very clear about this. Ten and not nine. Ten and not eleven. So it's very specific that it is the numbers one through ten. Okay. So a Sephirot for us is assigned a number and it means what that number means philosophically in this set of relationships of the Sephiroth. Okay. There we are. <clears throat> that is where I'll stop for now. And uh, the next video will be about an overview of the Ten Sephiroth. Okay, till then, bye-bye.